Um, we have the distinct pleasure of having Hank Chaser um, speak with us. This is a man that I met at our last cabin uh, fever lecture, and Kathy and I have gone around the world doing birding. And you know how there's, in every profession, there's always a bunch of people that you hear about, and the Kaysner brothers are people that we have heard about. And we heard about them in Bhutan, we heard about them in Borneo, we heard about them in the Philippines, and they all have these sort of little legendary stories about them. So when I was asked to do the introduction, actually I asked to do the introduction, but when I, when I got to do the introduction, I went on to the, um, onto the web to see if I could get a little information about Hank, and there's a, uh, a five-page article <laughs> in Audubon <laughs> with all sorts of highlights here. Um, Hank and his brother Peter are just uh, very accomplished, very uh, world, world-known birders, and they're pure birders. They saw most of their birds before there were guidebooks to these locations. So when we go and are shuffling through the pages, those pages weren't there when they saw most of these birds. So rather than go on and on, if you want to learn more about Hank, uh, just go onto the web and put his name in, and there's probably Google, like 30, 40 articles about it. Well, Audubon is the interesting one. Okay, the Audubon <laughs> is the interesting one. And just uh, look him up there. He's, what he's going to show you tonight, he's going to show you a couple of different places, but this is just a mere sliver of his experience. So, thank you very thank much you. for coming. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Can everybody hear? Can you hear? Everybody's here? Now, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Ron asked me to do this last year, and I couldn't fit it into the schedule. And uh, tonight we've got a cold and snowy night, but it's nice to see so many people in the audience. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. I enjoy going back and seeing what we saw years ago. Uh, I bird watch a lot with my brother Peter's in the State Department. My job was spice buyer at McCormick and Company. I made 198 foreign trips, overseas trips, for the 30 years, 35 years that I worked for McCormick. And bird watched along the way and had some wonderful experiences. But my most memorable experiences are the ones that I've shared with my brother Peter. When he lived in New Guinea, for example, we, I landed in Port Moresby and we went to the airport and got in a helicopter and went into the interior and landed on top of a mountain. The helicopter let us off and we camped for four days on top of a mountain and were picked up four days later. So uh, exciting things like that. There's a lot of excitement in this slideshow too. It's going to start with a little bit of Yemen. The Yemen has been in the news recently. You've all heard about Yemen. My brother and I had a wonderful experience there. Uh, so we're going to start uh, in the old days and there are enough people my age in the room that will remember when you went to the movies it wasn't just the movie and the advertisements for other movies but they had short subjects that came out first. It might be a cartoon it was often a cartoon or maybe a newsreel or something. Well, we're going to do that tonight. Uh, we're going to start in Yemen because it was a really sh short trip. It was a three-day trip that I made to Yemen when my brother Peter was living in Cairo. We decided to go there. Uh, Cairo, you can see on the map here, is Yemen at the southern end of the Saudi Peninsula. Pe people don't know very much about Yemen. Uh, you can see its location there. There's an awful lot of history and an awful lot about it. First of all, it's a mountainous country. You think of the Arabian Peninsula, the sand dunes. It's a very mountainous country. And we're going to fly into Sana'a, which is the capital, which as of yesterday, the U.S. Embassy people left uh, in great haste. And then we're going to go up to Kaukaban, number two on the map, and then down to the coast. It's a three-day trip, and we're going quickly because they're terrorists there. And my brother is a U.S. government representative. He's the consular head of the embassy in Cairo. So we arrived uh, there. We wanted to see the 10 endemic birds. Now, if you're a serious bird watcher and you go to a country, you want to know the birds that you can't see anywhere else. And there are 10 birds that are found just in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, one of those birds, and it happens to be the Yemen center, is found just in the country of Yemen. But the other ones are found maybe in uh, the southern part of Saudi Arabia. But these are the specialty birds that we want to go see. When we travel, we also look for other things besides birds. And I've traveled all over the world, and I've had wonderful meals. I've learned about culture. I've learned languages. There's so much more to traveling than just bird watching. And uh, one of the things that we learned when we were in Yemen is that's where uh, camels were first domesticated. Camels were domesticated there, and in 930 BC, the Queen of Sheba, in those days Yemen was called Sheba, the Queen of Sheba 
took a camel caravan into Israel and went and met King Solomon. And today, I just read recently, in the last couple of years, they've done some archaeological work in the Arava Valley of Israel, and they found a site there that they think the Queen Sheba arrived at, and there found bones of camels that are roughly from 900 BC. So we're finding the historical evidence or the archaeological evidence for the fact that these camels were first cultivated or domesticated, excuse me, in Yemen and used for transit of goods up into uh, Israel. The other thing about Yemen that's important is it's the original home of coffee. Coffee is one of the most uh, abundant crops today. It's uh, almost 10 million tons, one of the most popular beverages after water. It's probably the most popular beverage in the world and that it's originally from Yemen. So camels and coffee is important as those two things from that small country called Yemen. Now I flew in uh, from the United States. My brother came down from Cairo and we met at about three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning at the airport. When I went to see my brother, I was amazed that he was surrounded by soldiers. And it turns out because of all the risk of being there with all the terrorists, Al-Qaeda was active in the country at that time. Uh, the U.S. Embassy had arranged for us to have military guards. And we had probably a dozen uh, Yemeni troops, they weren't American troops, but Yemeni troops that followed us so that we would be safe. And we were under orders to move quickly, don't stop at one place for too long because once word got out that there were Americans in the town, we were likely to be kidnapped. It really was pretty scary. So we arrived early in the morning, we went up to Cal Kaban, which is a bird watching spot where most of those endemic birds are found and the sun rose as we stood there. And as the sun rose, we saw the spectacular scenery. Again, not the sand dunes that you think of for the Arabian Peninsula, but rather very rocky countryside. Uh, these mountains here are about 8,000 foot, so twice as high as the mountains here in Vermont. So very, very spectacular scenery uh, that first morning. There's Peter beginning to see the birds. Again, we're looking for those 10 endemic birds. Uh, often we are uh, att attract children and other people wondering what we're doing with telescopes and cameras and whatever. So we had a couple kids coming out and looking at us. Uh, some of the birds that we were looking for, and I apologize, the first part of the slideshow I just put together to show you Yemen. The bird photography wasn't of a very good scale, but these are birds that probably maybe haven't been photographed before. They're that rare, and very few bird watchers, for obvious reasons, are going into Yemen to go bird watching. This is called the Yemen Ascenter, a family of birds found in Asia, and this is the only bird that's found just within the country limits of Yemen. So that was very spectacular, just the close up. If any of you have done bird watching in Turkey, there's a bird there called the Rad's Ascenter that looks very much like this with a darker cheek patch, so closely related, but the Yemen Ascenter. This is what the bird habitat looked like where we're searching for these endemic birds, very rocky wadis, uh, very much like being maybe in southern Arizona, a lousy shot, but of the Arabian woodpecker, again, another bird that uh, most birders have never seen. If you saw this bird at your feeder, what would you call it? Female house finch, right? It looks exactly like that. Well, you know, you may have had this bit your feeder and you didn't know what it was. This is the Yemen sarin. Uh, this is an endemic bird to the southern Arabian Peninsula and it looks so much like our female house finch that you think it was. And really not that closely related. It's in the finch family, but not even in the same genus as our house finch. Now when we travel, we often stop and again interact with the local people. I'd been giving some lectures in Baltimore and I had a young fellow in the audience, a young child that came up to me one time. He said, oh, Mr. Kastner, he says, I've enjoyed your slideshows. He says, I want you to take uh, some of my trail mix. I make a homemade trail mix and I want you to take it on your trips with you so you have something to eat. So I had this idea that when I took it and I did on a number of trips after that and I would take it out into the countryside and I would share it with the local children and take my picture and then the next year go back to this uh, Hartford County in Maryland and the boy would be in the audience and he'd see his trail mix <laughs> being uh, served in Yemen or in Madagascar or in Indonesia. It was a lot of fun, but that's one of the kinds of things we do. Often interesting to see how people live. These kids were brushing their teeth in what we would call muddy water. There was a puddle in the road and they scooped up the water and were brushing their teeth there. This was a young gal in uh, Yemen. Uh, probably in the next year or so, she's going to be bundled up in a black hood and taken indoors and never to be seen again. Uh, in Yemen, we saw no women. Women do not come out. They're not allowed to come out. Uh, this young gal is, again, probably uh, very, very close to the time where, where she'll be taken indoors and never seen again. 
As I mentioned before with uh, Queen Sheba, Yemen being at the southern end of the Arabian Peninsula was also a, uh, an area where spices came from all over the world and were transited into Europe. So there were spice markets there and since I was working for a spice company I found that particularly interesting. So here you could see uh, red peppers and different spices, ginger from India. Uh, I met the spice merchant. Typical, these people all have uh, knives in their belts. You can see his uh, ceremonial knife, and he's holding uh, a carton that has uh, saffron in it. Saffron being the dried stigma of the crocus flower. It's the most expensive spice in the world. It's about $500 a pound. He probably had a half a pound, so he had quite a nice uh, collection of saffron stigmas there that he was selling at his spice bazaar. Again, another one of the surprises was to see all the agriculture there, besides the fact that coffee originally came from there. Uh, today, there's uh, a lot of fields. It's a very mountainous area, so you see these terraces, uh, very, very unique looking for that part of the world. And then architecture, another thing that you notice as you travel around the world is how people live. And in Yemen, they live on the tops of cliffs. For security reasons, they like to have their home on the highest point of land. So if anybody, if there were neighboring tribes, this is a tribal area, if other tribes were coming into that area, you'd be safe because your house would be up on top of a hill. Not only on top of a little hill, but on top of a big hill. And not only top of a big hill or a ridge, but if you look in the background on this ridge, you can see a couple homes that are on that ridge, probably 8,000 feet in elevation. Now the problem with that is if you need to go down to the stream to get some water, <laughs> that's hard to do. So obviously cisterns on the top of the houses that collect rainwater is the way that they get a lot of their water. Another one of the endemic birds, uh, this is a bird called the waxbill, the Arabian waxbill. Some of you may have been in Africa, there are other waxbill species, but this one unique to the Arabian Peninsula. Now after the first day, I must admit, the soldiers were getting a little tired of our schedule. You know, bird watchers like to get up first thing in the morning. <laughs> Soldiers don't, at least Yemeni soldiers, they didn't think that was a good idea. So they started to complain, and Peter and I are there only for three days. There are ten birds we have to see. So Peter actually wrote a letter, he, he knew Arabic, so he wrote a letter which dismissed the guards that we had. And after the first day, the, the guards left us, and now we're on our own. Just the car, the driver, we had a couple weapons in the car, the driver had a couple guns sitting on the front seat next to him, and off we go down the wadis to try to get to the coast. We went about a half a mile, and in the middle of the road is a terrorist with a machine gun. Now, I'm not Brian Williams, this is a real story. <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating. The car comes to a stop, the guy comes over with a machine gun, and here are two Americans, and he's some one of the tribal terrorists or something. It turns out he was in the same tribe as our driver, and the driver talked him out of kidnapping us. We were really, really lucky. But uh, that's some of the danger that we get into, some of the stupid things that Peter and I have done over years as we've traveled. Uh, close up of the driver again from the tribe. He looks like a terrorist, doesn't he? He wasn't, but uh, uh, in his tribe were terrorists. Besides the birds, the 10 birds that uh, we wanted to see and that we did see, there are lots of other birds that you see. This is one of my favorite birds and was the first international bird that I ever learned about. When I was about 10 years old in Baltimore, we had a uh, a bird lecture and friends of mine, this is back in the late 1950s, had just come back from the Taj Mahal and they were describing this wonderful bird with the crest and the long bill that's the hoopoe found in southern Europe through southeast Asia. So the hoopoe is one of my favorite birds so had to get that uh, picture. Sometimes that crest goes up, it's really one of the most spectacular birds. Besides the 10 endemic birds, there are other birds that aren't endemic. In other words, they're not birds found just in southern Arabian Peninsula. This one called the Rupal's weaver is just across the Red Sea in the northern part of Ethiopia and Somalia. So uh, a, a regional endemic, but not a country endemic uh, as some of the birds are. This is the Rupal's weaver. Wonderful bird to watch build its nest. I mean, these birds weave their nest with these long pieces of uh, plant material and have the entrance in the underside so that they can go up and they're protected from predators. This is the yellow vented bulbul, a pretty widespread Middle Eastern bird. Uh, a bird that was a lifer for me was the Bruce's green pigeon. We found a flock of green pigeons. Again, lousy pictures on this trip, but you can see the bright yellow belly of the Bruce's green pigeon. Also, when you're traveling around the world, if you're a really serious bird watcher, especially like my brother, you're not only looking for birds for your life list, you're looking birds for either 
continent list, you have an Asia list, an Africa list, a South American list. Well, we were in Asia and we were close to Africa, so we were getting some sort of birds from Africa. This was the gray hornbill that's very common in Africa, but for our Asia list, uh, this was a special bird. And then finally down along the Red Sea coast, you see Peter out there, he's looking up on the wire for the Abyssinian roller, another bird found in northern Africa and in Asia, just in the southern Arabian Peninsula. These are little green bee eaters that were along the way. Uh, the dark chanting goshawk, another African bird that spills over into the Arabian Peninsula. And I bet you can identify this bird. That's our osprey. Osprey is one of the very, very few birds that's found on all six continents. Uh, you can see it in Australia, Asia, uh, all over the world. Very widespread bird and much more common certainly in Vermont. I remember 40, 50 years ago when I first came to Vermont, you didn't see ospreys. Now you can go on the causeway up in Colchester and you can see 10 or 12 osprey nests from one spot along that causeway. It's incredible how they've bounced back. This bird called a sooty gall. The sooty and the white-eyed gall are two gall species, pretty much uh, restricted to the Red Sea, so it was fun to see them. And then the sun went down. That was the end of the uh, second day. Now we're heading back into Sana, and we have a couple places we want to stop, but the road is blocked. We've had an accident on the road, and we have to stop. So uh, we lost about three or four hours. Habitat roadside in a lot of the world. I mean, this could be in India. If any of you have traveled to these third world countries, it's really pretty sad when you look at the uh, roadside uh, habitat there. But we did find the Nile Valley sunbird, sort of a hummingbird-like bird. Not at all related to hummingbirds, but this pretty bird was right alongside the road. So for our Yemen uh, trip, uh, we had 124 species, 21 lifers, and 24 birds that were new for our Asia list that uh, we hadn't seen in Asia that were spilling over. Okay, Kazakhstan. I guess that's why you came tonight to see Kazakhstan. A fascinating country. Again, most American bird watchers uh, have not been there. When we were there, there was no field guide to birds of Kazakhstan, so that means a lot of homework ahead of time. And we did identify three different parts of the country that each had their own endemic birds, about five or six endemic birds in each of three locations that you'll see. And I wasn't sure which of these two pictures to put up in the front, uh, the one of the steppes, which is so typical of Kazakhstan, or this one of the Himalayan portion down near the, the, the border uh, with, with China. These are mountains that go up to 25,000 feet, so very, very high mountains. A little bit further to the east of where we are, these mountains are probably uh, 10 to 15,000 feet. Very spectacular uh, countryside. Kazakhstan is the largest landlocked country in the world. Uh, I think it's the ninth largest country in the world. Very, very big amount of real estate. Uh, it stretches from the Caspian Sea all the way over to the Chinese border. We're going to start here in the southern part in Almaty, the capital. We're going to go up into the desert area around Lake Balkash in the center part and then end up in Astana, the current capital, uh, up in the grassy plains. And in each of those three areas are a group of endemic birds. And the habitats we're going to look for are the mountains. If you look up here, the blue is the mountain and then the desert and then the grassy steppes of Central Asia. Uh, we're going to do this trip in five days. <laughs> we move really quick. I remember sitting in the airplane and they have these maps that come on you know, the screen above you and we can see uh, the plane is starting off in India. My brother was living in uh, Delhi at the time. I flew to Delhi. The plane's route went over Kabul. We've heard of that place probably 10 years ago. You never heard of Kabul, but over Kabul and around the mountains. These are the Himalayan mountains, the extreme uh, western part of the Himalaya Mountains. The plane route is going to go around. Here's the plane at the current time, just ready to go into Almaty, the capital of Kazakhstan. Beautiful mountains as you fly in. If you've gone into Denver Airport, and you see the Rocky Mountains off in the distance. Reminded me so much of that as we arrived in Almaty. Almaty in local language means home of the apple. Remember in Yemen, it's where the coffee came from. Apples come from Kazakhstan. And it's one of the largest crops in the world. I mentioned 10 million tons of coffee. 60 million tons of apples are produced in the world each year and originally cultivated here in Kazakhstan. Anybody guess which is the biggest country for producing apples? Who knew that? <laughs> Gary. Gary knew that. He gets a prize. If I had an apple, I'd give him an apple. China produces uh, more than half of the world's apples. It's incredible. Uh, which state in the United States produces the most apples? Washington State. Very good. I heard that too. This is a good audience to have answers to those two questions. 
My brother Peter, I'm really lucky because he's a serious bird watcher. He's one of the three or four top bird watchers in the world, and I just go along with him. He does a lot of work for us ahead of time on these trips that we take together. He had arranged uh, with this uh, lovely young lady who was a tour guide, and Europeans, especially the English, were beginning to set up bird watching tours, and her company was arranging uh, the logistics for these bird watching tours that were just starting in Kazakhstan of the Europeans. So here's Peter looking at the list, and then she disappeared, and off we go up into the mountains, our first stop. Uh, very, very spectacular. It's like going up into the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. Beautiful, one of the first birds we saw, the white-browed tit warbler. A unique bird to the Western Himalayas. This was lifer for both of us. And then finally to our first stop, our driver uh, wanted us to see this area. This is a dam area, and this on the weekends is a very popular weekend place for the locals to come to picnic because it's right on the water. But that delta in the background holds a bird that I had wanted to see for a long time, a bird that my brother had seen in Ladakh in the Himalayas, the central Himalayas, and it's a bird called the ibis bill. And this is not my photograph of the ibis bill. I see JC over there, who's an excellent bird photographer, saying, wait a minute, Hank, you've never taken a picture that good. Uh, we could not. These birds were breeding. We saw them through the telescope, but we didn't want to get close to their breeding area. So I took this picture, I forget, from someplace else. But this is the wonderful ibis bill that's found in the highest elevations of the Himalayas. Uh, very, very difficult to see in most areas. You've got to make a special expedition to see it. Uh, a bird unique, a family of its own. The ibis bill is uh, not closely related to uh, any other birds, although one would argue that it's sort of a shorebird looking kind of a bird. So thumbs up. I have to give a thumbs up. Uh, again, through the telescope was our only view, but that was certainly success. Our first overnight of the five that we're going to do is at a former Russian uh, observatory. Uh, an astronomical uh, observatory there, and you can see the buildings there. See how close it is to the lake. And some of the birds around the observatory were the uh, fire-fronted sarin. Uh, this is the European goldfinch, some of you may recognize. And then finally into the area where we're going to spend the night. Uh, these were barracks for the, the Russian scientists that were up there that were using uh, a lot of different uh, telescopes and things to look up into the sky. The Russians left there in 1991, so for 15 years it's been an independent country, and they're starting to use some of the facilities that the Russians left behind for ecotourism. We were very, very lucky. So here's some British people there on the right, uh, our driver and Peter enjoying our lunch before we go out into this short uh, juniper area to look for the endemic birds. The endemic birds up here were uh, mountain finches and birds called red starts that aren't related to our warbler red starts. Uh, we had a wonderful time. Even the birds that we'd seen before, this is called the white-tailed ruby throat, a uh, pretty widespread bird in the Himalayas. We'd both seen it before, but when you see a bird that's so pretty and you get a fairly decent picture of it, uh, it was a lot of fun. I like the close-up of it with its white eyebrows <laughs> looking right at me. Another bird that was a lifer for me was the white-winged grosbeak, and I got a picture of the grosbeak. The grosbeak was, it was posing for my brother Peter, who's got the camera there on the other side, and then Peter took a picture of the bird with me <laughs> on the background. So we had that one surrounded, but that's the white-winged white -winged grosbeak, a picture of the female a little bit higher up. Later in the day, we went up to the higher elevation where there was another observatory. Uh, there was less vegetation up there, and we thought, how could there be any birds at all? And uh, here was the camp, just lots of snow, but no trees or anything. But there was a, the red-billed chuff, which is a, a bird that you can see in Europe, pretty widespread alpine and Himalayan bird. And then a bird that was uh, a new one for us, the white-winged red start. And what that bird was doing up there, what it was feeding on in all that snow, it's hard to say. But he was just sort of shivering, shivering up there. Uh, but the uh, white-winged red start was a, a lifer for both of us. This is what conditions look like up there high in the mountains, maybe 10 or 12,000 feet in the late spring. And uh, sort of looks like maybe Alaska, or looks like the North Cape of Scandinavia, actually. It reminds me of Finland or uh, Norway, that sort of, that part of the world. After the first day, we'd seen all the target birds. It's the second day now, and we have some extra time, so we're just walking down the mountains, just enjoying the scenery, which we like to do if we have extra time, and we've seen all the birds, because if you haven't, then you want to see them, but uh, walking down the road. And as we were walking down the road, we noticed walking from the city, and if you look carefully, you can't really see it, but this is the town of Almaty, off in the distance, probably 10 or 12 miles away, it's Saturday, and the locals are walking up, not on the road, it would be a long walk on the road, but they're coming straight up on the pipe that comes from that reservoir that takes water into the town. 
Now, if you think that's easy to walk on a round pipe, you and I would be like this, but these people come up the whole way that way, and that's their outing for a Saturday. Out of the mountains, out into the uh, desert area, we're going to look now for four endemic birds to the Turang Forest uh, along the deserts north of Almaty. On the way, we see some familiar birds, the European roller, pretty widespread Eurasian bird, some larks, the calandra lark flies up, and there's a picture of the calandra larks. Larks are pretty widespread birds. We have the horned lark here in the United States, but in Europe and Asia, there are many, many dozens of different species of larks. We'll see some more later on. Uh, this is one that looks like a song sparrow. It's the corn bunting, not a sparrow, but a bunting. And then the red-headed bunting that for me was a lifer. Peter had seen it before, but that was a, a special bird for me. Out we go, there's a little bit of rain, and the rain makes some ponds, and the ponds provide some areas where some of the birds can nest. And this is a bird that's actually been seen in Vermont. I think, Ron, white-winged black tern, is there a record? It seems to me that it's a bird that's even on the Vermont list. A uh, very, very pretty bird related to our black tern, but when it flies in breeding plumage, this bright white wing is uh, very distinctive. Now, I wanted to show you a little bit about uh, the culture and how people live there. We are on the main road between Almaty, the previous capital, to their brand new capital, Astana, that's up in the north. This is the main road that we're on, and this is the rest stop. You know, if you've been on the New Jersey Turnpike and you go to the rest stop and there's a Starbucks and you know, restrooms, this is where you gas up on the, on the main road in Kazakhstan. Uh, this is the gas station. Peter said, I've got to go to the bathroom. I said, oh, well, we'll find out where that is. Well, there it was. <laughs> this is what the facilities were. This is how primitive some of these countries can be, some of the conditions that you have to get used to. Uh, some of the people out there, this is a very, very desert-like. This is like being in Arizona. A couple of cattlemen, but wherever there's water, there are birds. These were rosy starlings or rosy pastors, they're called, are very, very closely related to the starlings that we have in the United States. Those of you that have been to Africa realize that starlings in Africa are some of the prettiest birds. The golden-breasted starling in, in Kenya, for example, really spectacular. We're stuck with the most ugly starling in the world, I think, unfortunately. And guess what this one is? You've seen this before, the hoopoe again. He was nesting right uh, at the camp and was bringing food to some nestlings that were there. Now, as I mentioned, there was some infrastructure there because there were British birdwatching tour groups that were beginning to go to Kazakhstan. But when they wanted to go bird watching out in the desert, there was no place to stay. There was no former Soviet observatory like up in the mountains. So they put up this temporary structures, these yurts, uh, sort of like tents out in the middle of nowhere so that the bird watchers would have a place to stay. And that's where we stayed. We each had our own yurt. There were no tours. The tour season was over, so Peter and I were there by ourselves. We each had our own place to stay. And oriental rugs were on the floor inside, and then a little bed. It was really quite nice there in the middle of, of the steppes of Asia. This truck had all the food. All the food we were eating was great. And to be there as the sun went down and the stars came out. There's no factories within 1,000 miles. I may be exaggerating. A long way away from any industrial pollution. And the stars that you see there in the steppes of Central Asia, spectacular. The food was good uh, out of that truck. We see some apples there for good reason and uh, other things that we were eating. The next day, we're going out along the uh, Ely River. And this is an area that reminds me so much of southern Arizona. Uh, the Sonoida Creek, if you've been out bird watching in southern Arizona, a lot of the good bird watching spots are along the river valley, Sonoida Creek being the most famous. And there, it's cottonwood trees. In Kazakhstan, it's a different tree. It's called the Taranga tree, uh, but it looks very much like cottonwoods. And in those trees are four unique birds. There's a woodpecker, a pigeon, a chickadee, uh, I was going to say tit, but sometimes people don't understand that tit is the European word for chickadee, and a sparrow that's related to our house sparrow. So we wanted to see those four birds, and we had uh, two days to do that. Uh, the first hour we're there, we see the, uh, the yellow-eyed pigeon, and we see the woodpecker, and uh, we see uh, everything, including the Sushwal sparrow. At the end of the first hour, we've seen all four birds. What are we going to do? We've got a wasted day. But my brother's really smart. He knew that a bird watching group from England had been there a week before, and he knew the guy's name, and he had his phone number. So because he's in the State Department, he has modern communication equipment, he sits there in the yurt after we've seen the birds in one day and we have an extra day, and he calls the guy in England and says, we've got an extra day. What can we do? 
And the guy says, oh, he says, if you've got an extra day, you can go along the Chinese border because we saw the Mongolian finch there, very, very rare bird. And if you're lucky, you might see the palace's sand grouse. We said, yippee, two good more birds. So off we went back out of the woods, or excuse me, out of the desert, back to the mountains there in Almaty. Uh, we had an afternoon just to look at the city, again, to get a feel for the culture there. Modern buildings, this is a country that is fueled now by uh, petroleum along the Caspian Sea, a lot of oil wealth. So it's a very, very rich country that's modernizing very, very quickly. You see the modern buildings going up in Almaty. But some of the old is still there. This is, I think, are pipes that are used to transport natural gas from house to house. So you have this infrastructure, instead of pipes buried underground, Maybe it freezes and they don't want to bury them underground, but these pipes going through the town uh, taking natural gas from house to house. Uh, that afternoon we went to the zoo just to see what the zoo looked like to get a feeling for the people. These people are of Asian origin. You see most of them look sort of Chinese uh, looking there in Central Asia. Another picture, if you notice in the top of the picture, they've got an eagle, probably a golden eagle uh, that they're using. The photographer has that as a prop for his photographs, and then popcorn, you can have sladki, uh, which is sweet, or solieni, which is salted, either one of those popcorns there, just like in the United States. And then the next morning now, uh, this is the, thir the third day, uh, we're going out to see the Mongolian finch. Beautiful sunrise uh, to be out there with the mountains in the background, spectacular. As we went down the road, we saw these sand dunes on the, on the side of the road, and the driver explained to us that this was a camping site in the 13th century for Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan came from Mongolia and went all the way to Eastern Europe. In 70 years, he established the largest landmass territory of any empire in the history of the world. He did it in 70 years. And in some date in the late 1200s, he camped right here by these sand dunes. This was the beginning of the Silk Route. We're close to the Chinese border. Goods were coming out of China right along this valley and into Constantinople, into Europe uh, over, over the years. So a lot of history and things that you see uh, if you're keeping your eyes open. Well, we wanted to see the palace of sand grouse, and we saw a sand grouse fly across the road, but realized this was the black-bellied sand grouse. We were a little disappointed. But we stopped the car, and we got some pictures of the sand grouse grouse because it's an interesting bird anyway. We got the telescopes out and the cameras, and all of a sudden some policemen come up. What are you doing, they say. They're talking in Russian, but I speak Russian. So I was speaking Russian to them. Uh, I was lucky I went to Hopkins and studied Russian for four years. So I'm in a situation now where I can speak with these guys. So I told them what we were doing and that I was looking for a sand grouse that was a little bit different than this. And the guy said, oh, you want to see that one? He says, go a little bit further down the road. So we went further down the road. So instead of being arrested by the cops because we've got telescopes and cameras, because I spoke the language, we're buddies with them. And all of a sudden, we go down the road, and here's this long-tailed palace's sand grouse, a lifer for both of us, a little bit different looking than the black belly, especially that long pointed tail. So that was successful, but we still need to get close to the Mongolian finch. Down the road we go. We have some pretty good directions on how to get there, but the countryside was spectacular. You feel lost, sort of a feeling that if you've ever been to the Galapagos, these just bare hills, and you're just out in nature by yourself, and God's up there somewhere, and you just have this wonderful feeling of being alone in nature, and that's the way I felt as I was walking down this road. Uh, Gray-headed gray bunting uh, was along the road. What's this bird? You should be able to identify this. I heard somebody say just a couple minutes ago that they saw one of these today. Red-tailed hawk, right? Oh, yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> that's why you always have to know bird ranges. A red-tailed <laughs> hawk, of course, is not found in Central Asia. Uh, this is the long-legged buzzard. Uh, very closely related, obviously, the same genus as our red-tailed hawk. And it has a red tail, so uh, you could be fooled, but the long-legged buzzard. And finally, we get to the spot. The English guy was very particular. He says, you go down this road and 100 yards and turn, and uh, there's a little seep, a little bit of water that's coming out in the desert. And he says, as you sit there, these finches during the day will come and get their water. And we sat there and had my camera ready, and all of a sudden I looked down, and there's the Mongolian finch. Really very exciting. Uh, quite an interesting bird. Uh, I also got a great picture of the fly. I never had, a, <laughs> never had a picture of a fly that turned out that well, but this is the Mongolian finch that we got. Now, in a short period of time, we've seen those two birds, so there's nothing left there, so we did a little sightseeing. Uh, this is like Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah. Some of you may have been out there. Uh, very, very similar. This is the Ely River that comes in from China and goes up to Lake Balkash, and through this area has formed this uh, wonderful area. Stop dangerous for life, the sign says, because uh, they don't want you to go down in there and get lost. 
and then back into Alamati. Uh, we're getting ready to fly up into the steppes for our last uh, day of bird watching, but just along the roadside to see the homes, the mountains in the background, they give you a feeling for the countryside. The people that live there, fascinating people. Again, most of them of uh, Asian uh, background, the natives. Uh, here was a uh, local lady with her samovar making some tea. She offered us tea. Uh, a cup of tea as we were going down the road. And finally, we're going to fly now up into the steppes of northern Kazakhstan. This is a brand new capital. Remember when they took the capital of uh, Brazil and took it from Rio up into Brasilia and the politicians didn't want to go to Brasilia? The same way. They were in Almaty with the mountains and the great climate. And all of a sudden, the new president, he's got a lot of money. He's a dictator. He wants a new capital up in the steppes of the central part of the country. So they built this brand new city called Astana. Uh, it's a little less than a million people now, and that's uh, from starting out at about 500 people 20 years ago. It just started at nothing. Brand new buildings everywhere. Again, the oil, uh, the oil wealth, the uh, petroleum industry, new buildings, construction cranes. As we were going down the road, this is the president's house. This is the, the, the White House, so to speak. I was told, don't take a picture of it, so that's, I got a lousy picture out the car window. But the object of this was to see some birds that are in the steppes of Central Asia. How many of you have bird watched in, in Europe? Some of you bird watched in Europe. You have a European field guide and you've seen all the birds in Europe. You've seen the goldfinch and the, the robin and whatever, but there are a couple birds that are like found in the eastern part of Europe. There's the black and the white winged lark and the azure tit, uh, maybe a couple other birds that are found in the grasslands of eastern Europe that you really can't get there in Europe. And they always bugged me. I always wanted to see them. Well, if you go to Kazakhstan, you can see them. And they were the, the birds that we wanted to see. But it required going out into the grasslands. And you can get lost in the grasslands. So my brother Peter decided that he would get a guide. So we, we got the guide and uh, started to go out into the grasslands. If you remember in Yemen, it was the camel that was domesticated. In Kazakhstan, the horse was domesticated. It was about uh, 4,000 years ago, and the ancestor horse was from this area, and because the people uh, used the horses, uh, cer certainly Genghis Khan did when he came across uh, in the 1300s. So this is a, a native uh, domesticated animal to that part of the world. It was also, when the Soviets were there up until 1991, one of the bread baskets, wonderful agricultural land. When Khrushchev came to the United States in the late 50s and early 60s, I forget the exact date. I remember him out in Iowa and talking about these wonderful big farms. And he wanted to do the same thing in the Soviet Union. So he did it in Kazakhstan, and it became a bread basket. But while we were there, as I mentioned, my brother Peter decided we would get a guide so that we wouldn't get lost. So we hired a local, not a local, this is a British bird watcher who was there on a research project that I'll get to in a couple minutes. So he was going to take us so we didn't get lost. But we get out in the grasslands, and guess what? We got lost. We got really lost. And when you're lost there, you can't see the city in the distance. You can't see telephone poles along a road. You don't see anything. You're out there by yourself. And we went probably for three or four hours up and down across little marshy streams. I thought we were going to get stuck. I wasn't scared for my life, but I was just scared that I would never get home, or that I'd have to spend my, the rest of my life there. Only sign of life was this burial ground, probably for a Russian soldier with a red star there. We saw that. And finally, somebody to ask. We saw some habitation. Uh, the driver gets out and goes up, and these are the local guys. And we asked them, what is the way we're going to a city uh, where we're going to spend the night outside of uh, Astana? And uh, they didn't know how to get there. They'd never been there. So they were of no help at all. So down the road we go. We see the remnants of this great Soviet agricultural experiment. When the Russians left in 1991, guess what? They burned everything and destroyed everything that they could so that the late local Cossack people would not have anything. So you see all this agricultural uh, silos and barns and uh, residences just destroyed, burned in 1991 so that the Kazakhs would have nothing when the Russians were forced to withdraw. We did see some local people there. You can see the Chinese uh, ancestry people there in one of the burned out farm areas. Well, things got worse and worse. We started seeing little uh, cyclones and things like that, tornadoes. Uh, we were wondering if we we're ever going to get back home. And finally, and this usually happens to Peter and me. We've had wonderful luck. Finally, the rainbow, and we know we're going to have good luck. And we did find a road. And the guy says, oh, I think I recognize this road. I said, how do you recognize it? <laughs> oh, I think if we just follow this, we'll get to the town. And sure enough, we did. The good news was, while we were lost, we saw the four birds that we wanted to see. <laughs> we saw the steppe gall. Uh, this is a gall that looks just like our 
Herring gall, it's in the herring gall family. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of tox taxonomic changes in this family. This is a bird that was a species when we're there, and then we come home and now it's been lumped with the Caspian gall, which is a nearby species. But these galls are told by their heavy chests and the fact that their tails sort of droop down. And if you look at this bird, you see very typically the shape uh, of the steppe gall. We did see the black lark, that bird that's found also in Eastern Europe that was missing from our European list uh, and our life list, and the white-winged lark flew off. And so now we've seen all the birds that we wanted to see, so now it's time to do some bird photography. And uh, when you get a chance to see some of these birds up close, the Demoswell crane was walking down the trail. Uh, this is the rough shorebird in breeding plumage that uh, has very, very interesting plumage. Uh, the black-winged Pratt and Cole, a group of birds. Uh, this is another bird that's been found in uh, Vermont. It's on the Vermont list. I don't know, Ron, did you see this bird when it was here, the black-tailed godwit? I know there's, oh, I, I missed that one, but this is the black-tailed godwit, very nice picture. And as I mentioned, our guide was working for a project. He was uh, from England, and he was working on the sociable lapwing project. This is a sh bird like the killdeer that breeds out in the dry areas that winters in western India. Uh, there were thought to be only a few hundred of them left, and Peter and I had both seen it in India, so it wasn't a lifer for us, but to see it on its breeding grounds and its breeding plumage was pretty spectacular. And we did find a number of them because our guide was studying them and got some very nice photographs of the sociable plover, one of the rarest shorebirds in the world. And then finally, off in the distance, the town that we're going to to spend the night, uh, this was the uh, communal uh, government center building, and then we saw the building where we're going to spend the night. And we said, uh-oh, <laughs> it ain't the Hilton Hotel. It's not Holiday Inn, but uh, this is what you're up to. This is where these uh, British researchers were staying. Uh, it was uh, two of them, and then they had their local girlfriends. So they had a pretty good deal. See the guy not eating an apple, but eating a banana. I don't know where that came from, but far away. But here they are in, in the middle of Kazakhstan. Just to show you how primitive, again, is the, the water supply was from a well. They didn't have running water in that uh, place where we spent the night. But once you get inside, very European looking, they had computers. Uh, we had a very nice meal and a very pleasant night that we spent there in the plains of Kazakhstan. And then finally, in the last couple hours on our way back to the airport again, just to appreciate the expanse of those Central Asian steppes, uh, just very, very beautiful countryside. Uh, the yellow wagtail, uh, very, very common bird, one of the commonest birds we saw. Lots of migrating shorebirds. Uh, these are almost all shorebirds that have been seen, certainly in the United States, if not in Vermont. Uh, redneck stint is in there, the bird swimming. Uh, here is the, uh, what we used to call northern phalarope, the redneck phalarope, curlew sandpiper in the back. Uh, there's a sanderling there. So lots of birds that we were familiar with. Uh, this is the breeding plumage of the sanderling, a bird that when we see it here in Vermont is a black and white bird, mainly a white shorebird, very, very white. But in breeding plumage, just for a couple of weeks a year, it gets this very golden uh, sheen to it. And then finally, uh, just again, to see the change in the culture. This is a shepherd that uh, years ago would have been walking, and now he's got his bike. Probably 10 years later now, he's probably got a motorbike or something like that, uh, ATV. Uh, but this is the change that you see as you go down and finally back into Astana. Again, the skyline. We're going to go to the airport. Uh, the last bird that we saw was the reed bunting. Uh, we saw 212 species of birds in those five days running around. 30 were lifers, and 18 were new for our Asia lists. Uh, so it was very, very successful. When Peter and I end a trip, we always have to have ice cream. If we're bird watching in Vermont, it's a creamy. Uh, here it was one of these uh, chocolate bars. So we get the thumbs up, very successful trip, and a nice ending when you can end with an ice cream bar in your hand at the airport on your way home. And that's it. Any questions? There's that rosy starling again. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't take that picture either. Two pictures I didn't take, the Ibis Bill and this ending one of the, it was such a good the end picture that I just had to put it in there. But JC, I didn't take that picture either. <laughs> yes? What was the power source up there in the steps? Generator. Generator. Yeah. You know, Peter and I throw caution to the wind. I've never worried so much about water. I've traveled all over the world, almost 200 trips from McCormick, and I've been in the jungles of South India and Papua New Guinea and all over, and we drink the water. We were a little bit careful. 
uh, and we've never, either one of us been sick. We're very, very lucky. My wife drinks bottled water here in Vermont. I said, why are we spending money for bottled water? <laughs> Just, you know, get tap water. So I think we've gone overboard, but certainly for most Americans, because we've traveled so much, both my brother Peter, who's lived overseas in the State Department, because he lives in a country for three or four years, and I've traveled uh, starting at age 10 overseas, I think my stomach is used to the most of the bugs. Now you can go to Pakistan or India and get uh, Somebody had disent. I mean, there's some diseases that you're going to get, even though uh, you've had some experience in those parts of the world. But I've been very, very lucky. So I usually throw caution to the wind. And very few times can I remember refusing a drink, even a glass of water, from somebody uh, because I think I'm going to get sick. I've just been very lucky. Conservation efforts, uh, I don't know of any in either country. Uh, in the case of Kazakhstan, you have this wonderful, the, the plains, and it's just such a big expanse that that's not an issue. Uh, certainly in the desert area where there are four unique birds, but who wants to live in the desert? So we didn't see any people. There was no pressure on that habitat. And then up in the Himalayas, again, a pretty wild area, so that's no, not so much an issue. In Yemen, I really don't know what's going on in Yemen. That, that place is really at the end of the world. Uh, I gave a talk yesterday for a group on Madagascar, and in Madagascar, uh, there's a lot going on in conservation because of their unique avifauna and uh, flora and fauna in Madagascar. Madagascar, and I'll have to come back and do that slideshow for you maybe next year. Uh, Madagascar is more unique than the Galapagos. In the Galapagos, 75% of the birds and animals and plants are unique to the Galapagos. There's no place in the world except Madagascar that has a higher percentage. And Madagascar is about 85% and the lemurs and the birds, and yet the pressure there by the population to chop down the forest for firewood or for agricultural land is giant. And during my travel in Madagascar over 50 years, I saw a large expanse of rainforest just disappear. And uh, there are lots of things that are going on, some that where I, I was involved with uh, Conservation International to protect those areas. I was lucky in Madagascar, my, my shipper there was making a lot of money selling me vanilla. And he got paid, uh, and the local currency was the Malagasy franc, but he couldn't take Malagasy francs back to France, where he lived, and spend them. He couldn't exchange them for hard currency. So he had what he used to call monopoly money. He says, I've got this money. I can't do anything with it. I said, put it into conservation. So he gave several million dollars to Conservation International to help some of their projects there. So I was really responsible for twisting my, my shipper's arm at no cost to him, because he couldn't do anything with the money anyway, to help preserve that uh, dwindling rainforest in Madagascar. So that's, that's an interesting conservation story. But JC, I don't have that much of a good story on Kazakhstan, on Yemen for that. I'm, I'm hey, sorry. Could you, uh, could you tell the story about the, uh, the, the meal you had? In Oh, my favorite meal. I had a meal tonight that was one of the most, is it, this is the story you want me to tell? <laughs> Gary cooked a meal t that we had tonight. Maybe Kathy helped it sometime too. It was absolutely spectacular. We didn't know what the name was. It was puff pastry with mushrooms, onions, ham, shrimp. It was one of the most delicious meals I've ever had. Is that the story you want me to tell? No. Not that one, okay. <laughs> I thought you wanted to get credit for a delicious meal that we had. <laughs> my meal story is, that in Madagascar on one of my first trips, and when still there was rainforest around, I flew up into the vanilla area on my shipper's private plane, and we arrived on the jungle landing strip. We went to his cabin, and we had lunch. And we knew that lunch was going to be something indigenous. So we're sitting down, and I get a plate of food, and there are these little look like baby chickens fried or something on there. So I said, to the, I said to the chef or my host, I forget who I was asking, I said, what are we eating? And they said, ah, le pigeon bleu, the blue pigeon. I said, blue pigeon? I said, that's a very, very rare bird. I've never seen it, but uh, it's a very rare bird. It's one of the birds I want to see in the jungle tomorrow when I go out in the jungle. I said, are, are you sure it's not the pigeon vert, the green pigeon? The green pigeon is much more common. That would be the likely one. Oh, no, monsieur, the pigeon bleu. I said, are you sure? He says, wait a minute. So he goes back into the room, into the kitchen, and he comes out with a tray where they've plucked these birds, the feathers, and he's got a tray full of all these blue feathers. And he says to me, Monsieur le pigeon bleu. I said, yeah, bien sûr, bien sûr, that's the pigeon bleu. So that's my story. So I ate that, and then the next day with the, the chef, we went out into the jungle about 15 minutes outside of town, and there was the, the blue pigeon. So I ate it first, and then I saw it the next day. So I guess that's the story that's made its way around. Today, when you go back to that vanilla growing area, you have to go two and a half hours to find the forest. 
and talk about conservation because they're planting vanilla, they're planting coffee, cloves, other spices and things in, in, in or Madagascar. Uh, the rainforest is really under great threat, and if it's not preserved in the national park, it's just disappearing. But that's my story of eating the bird before I added it to my life list. <laughs> the blue pigeon. Yes, Val. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I love that question. I love that question. I, I, call, I call it the, 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 the rare bird idea. With a rare bird, a rare bird is something that you hear about. Black-tailed godwit at Dead Creek, okay? And you, you're really excited, and you run down there, and you see it. Yikes, it's really neat. And then you go home and you think, golly day, I saw the Godwit. So you have this anticipation, the realization, and then the memory. It's, 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 it's ab absolutely incredible. And it's the same thing with bird watching. You can do that on an uh, international basis, like I've showed you with the rare birds or the endemic birds found in Yemen. You can do it in Vermont. I moved to Vermont two years ago. I have a Vermont list. It's approaching 300. I'm really happy because uh, there are people that have been here a long time and haven't seen that many. So you hear a rare bird and you go after it and you think about it and then you go there and you see it and then you go home and check it off and think about it again. I mean, bird watching can be done any place. I have a list for my condos. We have, I live in a condo in a field in Shelburne. We are 98 species that I've seen just in the condo. And then I was telling Gary on the way over, I've got a new hobby now. It's called the 251 Club. Do you know the 251 Club? I'm really sucked into the 251 Club. <laughs> I didn't know that there was a town called Chittenden right down the road here. Uh, not in, it's in Rutland County. It's not even in Chittenden County. It's the largest town in Vermont. And then I found a place called Baltimore that I thought was the smallest place because it's only 4.6 square miles down in the south, southern part of the state. But that's the second smallest. You know what the smallest town in Vermont is? It's only 3.5 square miles. St. George, has anybody driven from Hinesburg up to the, <laughs> you go through St. Do you live in, you live in St. George, okay. Oh, you don't, okay, at any rate. But, I mean, but this, you can, you can bird watch internationally, you can bird watch locally, you can get your kicks out of the towns in Vermont. And you can enjoy the towns in Vermont. We started going, my wife and I started looking at these 251 towns. You can't believe, have you been to the Marl House in Stratford? This beautiful pink house that's 150 years old, the first place in Vermont on the national list of historic places. Incredible farm that's bright pink. And somebody came with lots of money and they refurbished it like they've done in other part, places of Vermont. You think you're in Manchester, you're in the middle of nowhere. Beautiful, tiny little village, and here's this pink house and pink barns, the Marl House. Incredible, and the things that you stumble upon when you're driving along just to check off the 251 towns. <laughs> just keep your eyes open. It's a wonderful world out there. It really is. Yes? When you went to new places, you connected with guides. Did you have a system for that? Well, I tell you, in the old days, I didn't, because when I first started traveling to Madagascar, I was the only person in Madagascar. I was the only American in Madagascar. One of my first trips there, I rediscovered a bird that was considered extinct because bird watchers hadn't been there in 30 or 40 years. It was just that primitive. Uh, matter of fact, in my first couple of trips to Madagascar in the 1970s, it was so dangerous there. It was a communist government. I was the only American going in there because I was buying their vanilla crop, and they had to have the U.S. dollar hard currency. And I was actually a CIA operative during those days. The CIA guy would come from Washington to my office in Baltimore. He'd say, here's the things we want you to look for. And I would go to Madagascar, and I would look to see and try to get information to take back to our government. And if you remember in those days in Time Magazine, this is the Cold War. Uh, I remember it very well. Maybe you don't. But they would every once in a while have a map of a part of the world, Asia. And they would have the countries that were Soviet countries, the red countries that would be in red color. And if it was Southeast Asia, it would be North Vietnam would be red, and China would be red, and Thailand would be blue, because they were on our side. You know, it was blue against red. Well, they had a map of Africa. And the Africa map had Somalia was red, but Kenya was blue, because they, they were on our side. It was red and blue. Madagascar was a question mark. And one trip I go over there, and the CIA guy says, we really think that the Russians have an Air Force base in Tananarive, the capital city. 
We hear rumors of that, but we can't confirm it. So I'm there, and the plane's taken off. I got my camera ready, and I look out, and there are two dozen MiG jets sitting between the two runways of the international airport, covered with a tarpaulin. So you can't see, you know, if you're flying over, you couldn't see with a spy plane. So I took a picture of this and went, and the CIA guy comes a couple days later after I got back, and I said, look at this picture. MiG jets, there's an Air Force base. The Russians are there. We didn't know it. And a couple weeks later, the map comes out in Time Magazine. Guess what? Madagascar's red. <laughs> and I did it. So that's enough about me. Now, I, I, I've had such a wonderful time traveling, working for the CIA. I've had lunch with the king, met the king of Tonga. Uh, I, I can go on and on and on, but I won't bore you. A question. Oh, I became interested in bird watching when I was 10 years old. Uh, my grandparents had a place north of Baltimore out in the countryside. Uh, my fraternal grandparents, and we'd go out there on the weekends and spend the summer there. And we were out in the woods. Uh, it was near a river and in a park. And we were collecting butterflies and turtles and things like that. And I got interested in butterflies. And then when I was 10 years old, my maternal grandparents were living in Mexico City. They said, come on down to Mexico for the summer. So I went at age 10 with my brother. And not my brother Peter, another one of my brothers, we went to Mexico. And uh, we were in Chapultepec Park, and I've got my butterfly net because I'm interested in butterflies at age 10. And a bird flies up next to the picnic table, and it's a bright red bird. And my first reaction is, I wonder what it's called. You know, with butterflies, the monarch butterfly, and it's tiger swallowtail, you're identifying these things and categorizing them. That's what I wanted to do. I see a bird, I can't categorize it. It's a red bird. The next day, I'm in a bookstore in Mexico City. And there's a bird book, and it's got four pictures, color photographs of four birds, a blue jay, a red-headed woodpecker, uh, a brown thrasher, and this red bird that I'd seen the day before. It was a vermilion flycatcher. And that was the first bird on my list. I was hooked. Now I've got a book. So I go back to Baltimore, and we spent the uh, Christmas vacation each year in South Florida. And my dad, I was the oldest of all the kids, and my dad was looking for things to do. And now the oldest kid is interested in birds, so we went into the Everglades. And now there are roseate spoonbills and their ibis and all this stuff. Well, we, the whole family got hooked on bird watching, including my brother Peter, who's uh, eight years younger than me. So we, we did it as a family thing, but started in Mexico City in 1955 with the Vermilion flycatcher. Eight o'clock, I guess it's time to go home. Thank you all for coming. Great. Thank you very much.